Welcome back to another edition of the Net Report Podcast. I'm Mike Broadbent. Joining me is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite. Uh, pretty rough weekend uh, for Rutgers football. We went into Minnesota um, and lost 31 nothing. I think that score is kind of a little bit uh, not indicative of how the game went. Got a little out of hand at the end. Um, so we're going to go over that game. We're also going to talk about the Rutgers basketball scrimmage that was yesterday to uh, benefit Eric Grand and uh, his his foundation for spinal cord research. But first, this podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet on, uh, basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends on Bet Online. And as your continued source for all your sports wagering information, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. Uh, it's always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. You can head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Uh, make sure to use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. And that's Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, and as always, we're also sponsored by Adam Goldman. He's a franchise coach. Uh, basically, if you just want to change up your career, change up uh, just change up your everyday lifestyle. Get rid of that 9 to 5 and be your own boss. Uh, he's the guy to talk to. Uh, like I said before, his nickname is the franchise coach. He'll help you, help you set up your own, uh, your own business. Um, whether that be, uh, I don't even know, um, an urgent care or Duncan or McDonald's or something like that. Um, he uses extra cheese to just basically find others their new American dream or the new age American dream. Uh, if you want to get, uh, reach out to him, give him a call, 844-800-3726 or uh, franchisecoach.net. So let's talk about this Rutgers-Minnesota game. So Rutgers was going into this one a 14-point underdog. A lot of us thought that was pretty off, given how Minnesota had played the previous three games. They were really struggling in Big Ten competition. Uh, but they just we just had no answer for their run game in, in reality. They just had a, a lot of long drives. We had some great punting by, uh, by Adam Corsak. And anytime you have to start – with what went well with punting. It probably was a long day. But in reality, it was just the difference in the game. It was Muhammad Ibrahim. Like, every time they needed two yards, he got three. He was always breaking first contact. He was always falling forward. Um, but tell me a little bit about what you saw in this game. Uh, yeah, like you just kind of mentioned, they dominated up front. Um, <laughs> Muhammad Ibrahim got got smacked a couple times, and it's just yards after, the, after contact. is just incredible. He just keeps going and keeps plowing through guys. Um, what do you call it? Three touchdowns on a day, 160 yards almost, 159, whatever. Um, yeah, they didn't really have to do much through the air. Obviously, Tanner Morgan did throw it a little bit here and there, but th this run game was unstoppable. And then their backup too looked pretty good. Trey Potts was even like running for a couple gains here and there. I think he had six for what am I looking at? Six for 60. Like that's that's pretty damn. It's like 10 yards to carry. So I mean, end of the day, they couldn't stop the run and. <laughs> I don't want to say it's like a, a preview of what might happen this week with the run game, but Michigan's run game is a hundred times better than Minnesota's. So it's, it was just, I wouldn't go that thing. far. They're, they're better, but Muhammad Ibrahim is going to be an NFL draft pick. So will Blake Corum. And yeah. I thought we did a pretty good job bottling them up. Like the first three quarters, he had 31 <laughs> carries for like 129 yards. So it was like, mm. he was averaging like 3.8 yards per carry. It's just, after, you know, three quarters of being on the field, basically the entire game, the defense just, Start to get tired, and that's just what you expect when – I think they had a 41-minute time of possession through that one, and that's just from these really long drives. Like, they had that one drive. Adam Corsak punts probably one of the best punts of his career. Downs best the one-year line. Well, that, that one was great too, but the one that he oh, downed the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they drive 99 yards for a long, you know, 20 – it was like almost 20 plays for a touchdown. And then he, you know – the next possession, he punts it 77 yards. They drive it, you know, 80-some yards for another touchdown. They just kept sustaining these drives, and we had no answer. Uh, in the first half, we had those, we had two third and longs we set them up in. One, <clears throat> Tanner Morgan rushed for, like, a 15-yard gain to get the first down. And on the mm -hmm. other, they had that, like, screenplay to a running back who broke a couple tackles. It wasn't uh, Ibrahim. It was their backup running back and got the first down. So, we just could not stop them on third down all day. I think they converted roughly 70% of their third down attempts and all of their fourth down attempts. And if you can't stop a team on third down, no matter how good your defense is playing, you're just not going to win games. 
Yeah. Um, you mentioned Corsak. I don't know where he's been all season, but like the past two weeks, it's like a totally different player. Uh, he's been absolutely phenomenal. Like, what, he had a 77 yard this week, and then he had a 60 something yard the week before. Uh, he's averaged, he averaged like 50 something yards per punt. Like, it's, I don't know where he's been, but this is just such a game changer. I know it sounds crazy to say the punter's the game changer, but that's, that's where we're at currently with the offense being so stagnant. Um, Winsack didn't look too bad. Obviously, he got his first start. Uh, Church, second year freshman, whatever you want to call him that. Um, he, he didn't look awful, but he didn't look great either. Like, there's just, I think this is at the point now where it's it's kind of like you're going to ride the highs with Wimsat and you're going to ride the lows with Wimsat. This is your this is his team now. Um, Greg kind of reiterated that in the press conference today and just said that, like, Wimsat's QB1. He's healthy. He's good to go. He'll be the starter Saturday. And um, a lot of people might not be happy with that, but you, you really don't have another option at the point at this moment. So not sure really what you do. I do think that Gavin looked better than uh, the first couple games of the season because he really only mm-hmm. played in, in uh, the, the the Boston College game and the Wagner game. He got hurt early in the Temple mm-hmm. game. And there were some throws that he made in this game that he didn't make in the first couple games. Like that one specifically I'm thinking of was a rollout to the right. He's getting close to the sideline, and he throws it on the run to Sean Ryan. Perfect pass along the sideline, catches it for a first down. He had a few ugly drops by his receivers, but he also did sail the ball quite a bit. He sailed it over Johnny Langan's head. The one, the second drop by Chris Long was thrown way behind him. Still catchable. As a D1 receiver, you got to catch that. But mm. I do think that Wimsett has shown improvement. But, I mean, he still went 6 for 17 on the day with an interception. He's still like a career, like 40-some percent completion percentage guy. He's got to make bigger jumps. I hope I, – and, and also – I don't get why we're not putting him on the move more. Like he yeah. is very comfortable on the move. You could tell that his, his best passes are coming when he's able to get outside the pocket and he's not doing that enough. And I don't know if that's by design. I don't know if he's been told basically don't run. Minnesota was basically teeing off on him the two times that he did run and mm-hmm. slide. I don't know how that wasn't a penalty. Both times yeah. he was in the action of sliding and they just hit him right around the head and neck area. Mm-hmm. It's so inconsistent in college calling that because in the NFL, that's called every single time. Yeah, especially if you're one of the big names like the Mahomes of the world or Josh Allens. But, uh, yeah, besides the point, they not, not a lot of, like, what, almost no RPOs, I want to think, I want to say, if I recall not correctly. Not a single RPO. Nope. Um, super questionable decision there, especially when you have such a mo- mobile quarterback with Wimsat. We saw slight glimpses of that earlier in the year. Um Honestly, I mean, like I, I keep reiterating it. Ever since that big run that he had against Boston College, I've never seen a Rutgers quarterback do that. Like, yeah, ever maybe. Um, well, since no, since he did it in the oh, bowl game against Wake yeah. Forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it's it's incredible. Like you have to use that ability, and that's you don't have many quarterbacks in the in the college football right now that have that type of dual threat ability. Yep. Um, obviously, some there's a couple here and there, but uh, you got to take advantage of that. You got to use that more. I think you got to install more RPOs. Uh, even if it's the most basic stuff, like obvious, Nunzio is not taking over the job. I don't think I'd be a little no. shocked if he got the he's, OC job. He scored but, seventeen. He's led the uh, offense to seventeen points in eight quarters the last two games. I think yeah. of those two games, he's had like twenty-two or twenty-three offensive drives. Mm-hmm. Fourteen of them have ended in punts. Three of them, yeah. ended, four of them have ended in turnovers. Like he's only scored on three of those. So yeah, so if I you're him, just get creative at this point. Get, get a little nutty. Like have fun with it. Um, let Wimsat do his thing. Let him run a little bit. Uh, it's and then like you know it sucks. And Sean Ryan, this is this is his final year of college because he, he's looked, I know. he's starting to come on a little bit. And now it's like oh shit, like this could have been a really good receiver, but there's no quarterback to get on the ball. There's no protection for the quarterback to get on the ball either, which isn't helping. So the myriad of things. Um, obviously, the running game stinks without Sam Brown. That's just flat yeah. out stinks. We like, averaged two point three yards per carry on Saturday. Um, Salam was so, I, I thought he was going to be so good and so optimistic after game one. And then it's like, yep, no, nope. I don't know what happened to him. He averaged 0.3 this week. I think uh, the problem is they try and use every back the same exact way. They don't, they don't change any of their calls depending on their mm-hmm. personnel in the game. So they're trying to run Salam up the middle. Manung guy's more of a, a between the tackles runner, but he, even he isn't like, you know, super great at breaking tackles. So for Salam, it's got to be outside runs. I don't know why they're not using yeah. him on like wheel routes or screens because that's his game is getting him in space. He's not great when he's, you know, running <laughs> between the tackles and he doesn't shed contact well. So mm-hmm. I think part of the next offensive coordinator hire, which we saw from Sean 
uh, Gleason early on in his tenure is really getting a good gauge of what personnel you have, what their skills are, and how do we optimize an offense around those guys. And I, I get that we've had a talent deficiency at Rutgers for a while under Shiano as he builds this program back up. But it's yeah. going to be year four next year. You have no more excuses for a talent deficiency. These are almost all your guys at this point. We've got a lot of young guys in the program, especially along both offensive and defensive line. There should be no more uh, reins on this offense or defense. Defense has been fantastic. But yeah. I, I don't. There's no more excuses on offense. You have to get it done, whether that be through the transfer portal or developing guys. Just get it done. Like we're tired of hearing excuses about the offense. Yeah, I know you mentioned screens before, but like, why is there so little amount of passing behind, like at the line of scrimmage? Like, run a wide yep. receiver screen here and there. You have some of the speediest wide receivers in college football. And I don't think that's that's not cap. That's like a fact. Right? Aaron Kruchek's fast as hell. Joshua yep. Youngwood went healthy, got fast. Chris got Chris Long, leading all time receiver in New Jersey history. Like, you got guys that got speed. Sean Ryan's even pretty fast for his size. But he, he should be able to block up for, uh, on a wide receiver screen real quick and just get something going. Like, it's just – it's miserable to watch this offense. Like, the offense comes out, and a lot of fan bases are usually like, yeah, ooh, ooh, offense, like, yeah, ooh, rah, rah, rah. Mm -hmm. This offense comes out, and I'm like, holy shit, here comes another three and out. Like, what, what are we doing? Like, change it up. Get a little creative. Do something different. Um, Aaron Young came back, but he really didn't do much either. And if, if he's 100%, I think he's got to be the starter. Like, Manon guy's yep. just not it. Salam's not it. Um, I don't know. There's this team's got a lot of issues right now, and uh, I don't think it's going to be solved anytime soon. It needs to. You have to hit the portal pretty hard this off season, and you got to revamp a lot yep. of stuff. And it and honestly, it starts with an OC. You got to get a good OC. You got the money. There's no excuses now. Like your Big Ten football, top conference, top two conferences, whatever you want to call it. There's there's zero excuse why you shouldn't have a good OC, and he shouldn't be able to develop Wimstad at least a little bit over the next six to 12 months, whatever it is. Yeah, it's kind of wild that, you know, Gavin just turned 19 on Saturday and he's already played, you know, a season and a half, or let's just call it a little more than one season of yeah. college football because he came in a few games late last year and we're about mm -hmm. midway through this year. Uh, and he's only 19. So I do think that we're we're judging him a little harshly because he, he's been in the program two years, but he's still young. He was still a multi-sport athlete until his senior year in, in high school. He never focused purely on football until this past year. So I do think this will be a, a, an absolutely critical offseason for him to develop. And that OC hire, I mean, he's got to get in and just start bonding with the quarterback. And it's got to be probably – it's most likely going to be Gavin moving forward because I do mm -hmm. think he's shown the most potential – and he has shown improvement this year. But that improvement needs to be, you know, 10 times what it was from last season to this season in order for him to, to really be a standout at, at quarterback, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it's tough because, like, end of the day, like, I keep looking around the country, and there, there's some lot of young guys that are thriving right now. So that's that's where that argument gets a little, a little bit tougher. Quinn Ewers looks great. Mind you, Texas has a lot bigger talent, to, a lot more talent, I guess. Um, Caleb Williams last year at Oklahoma, a lot more talent there as well. But like he's also came in right away, not right away, I guess. He won the job midway through the season over Rattler, and he looked pretty pretty good. Now he's like one of the uh, Heisman front runners. Like there's there's a lot of young guys out there. There's not really like an excuse in my book, in my opinion, for for youth. But I do think he's he's got to step it up. He's got to work on his accuracy all season long. Um, that's the biggest the biggest knock on him at the moment. And then. Like I said, play calling. They got to get him moving a little more. Like, get yep. him out of there. Let him run. Let him go nuts. Because I, I think this guy has potential to be like a, I don't want to compare him to Daniel Jones, but like he could run for 100 yards and pass for 180, and everyone would be like, holy shit. Like, ooh, offense is moving. Like, let's go. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it is tough, um, especially when your O line doesn't block. And that's, that's another issue. Yeah, there's a famous Mike Leach quote where, like, he was talking about how accuracy really is hard to teach. You either mm -hmm. were the kid that could hit the, <laughs> hit the street sign with a snowball or you weren't. Like, accuracy is very tough to teach. It, it is yeah. possible, though, if you look at a guy like Josh Allen, what he did in college, I think he was a career, like, 53% passer in yeah. Wyoming and, and Juco, and now he's, you know, almost at 70% in the NFL. So there are instances where you can get better, but it really takes, like, it takes a lot of effort. Like, it's going to take mechanics changes. It's going to take uh, understanding of when you need to really fire it in there when you don't, because that's another thing. Everything from Gavin comes in as a heat-seeking missile, 
and he needs to know when he's got to feather it in there. He needs to know when he needs to loft it. Sometimes you really do need to fire it in there with all your with all your throw strength. But a lot of these bullets that it's, his uh, pass catchers are dropping are just because they're coming in so hot when they're not used to it. So they yeah. have, to, have to get used to it, and he also needs to know when is the appropriate time to just rip it. And that's why I keep stressing it. Like, everyone keeps asking, why, why does the OC have to be a QB coach as well? Like, you need someone that can develop. And don't tell me yep. you're going to go hire a QB coach separately. I don't think that's even an option at this point. You need a guy that can do both, and that's what most co coaches in college do at this point. I want to say at least 60 to 70% of OCs are coaching quarterbacks as well. So, I mean, go, go through the list that we put up um, not too long ago. There's, there's a bunch of QB gurus, if you want to call them that. And then... Get him, in, get him in the lab nonstop with the trainer this offseason. I know he worked with Danny Hernandez, who's like Bryce Young's trainer, a uh, bunch of other big names. I think Stetson Bennett actually was working out with him recently. But uh, get him in the lab with these guys like nonstop. Like he's got to be throwing the ball constantly. Or even do what the guy on the one guy on our message board is suggesting. Just put the tire on the tree and just fucking try to hit it nonstop. Like, <laughs> you got to get the accuracy going. You got to fix it. Yep. Like so, Something's got to give. And it's, it's just, it frustrates the hell out of the media just as much as it frustrates the fans because we got to watch it every day too. And it's, it's just rough to watch this offense that's been stagnant for God knows how long. Like it's, it's frustrating. It's funny to look back at the days of when we had, uh, you know, Mike Teal through like Gary mm -hmm. Nova basically, where we're constantly complaining about quarterback play, but I would kill to watch one more game of Mike Teal or one more game of Gary Nova. Uh, as Rutgers quarterback at this point, because we, you don't really know, and a lot of well, this is the same across all places. Like, you know this from being the Penn State mod now. Like, how many mm -hmm. people bitch and moan about Sean Clifford? And we would take Sean Clifford in a heartbeat as our quarterback. That kind of yep. those those kind of performances, because his his problem is he shifts the bed against Ohio State or Michigan. It's mm -hmm. not that he can't beat up on you know the Indiana's, Purdue's, et cetera, types of the world. Um, it's just he can't get over that last hump to lead them to like a college football playoff type berth. Yeah, and it's it sucks because like he, I actually do think he's. This, we're not gonna make this bench state show, but he is a pretty good quarterback, no. and Rutgers would take him in a heartbeat. Um, but like it's it's crazy. Like fans will be fans, and they're they're calling for his head after two wins in a row, and it's like, what are you doing? Like, um, but yeah, now now we get to see the Gavin Wimsat experiment, and we'll we'll see what uh like I said, you're gonna you're gonna get some really high highs with them. But you're going to get some really low lows, too. So he's going to be chucking the ball, and you'll see, like, a 60-yard touchdown catch, and you're like, oh, my God, we haven't seen that all season. And then you'll see, like, yeah. a, a really badly overthrown interception. You're like, yo, what's what's going on with this kid? Get him out. Yeah. But th that's the thing. You don't have another option. And I'm more concerned about what the roster looks like next year because you kind of just anointed Wimstat the starter for the rest of this season. You don't have one coming in, so it's probably the starter next season at, well, at least. So if I'm Simon, I hate to say it, I, and – He's, he's not staying, probably. Simon's probably not staying um, if he doesn't feel like he's got, you know, a legit shot at playing. So that's mm -hmm. one problem. So you, you would like what's if, – if I had to guess what's going to happen, we hire an OC. Whatever school the OC was at, whatever quarterback commit they have, he tries to convince them to come on, assuming that it's like a, a lower-level kid. Mm -hmm. And then we end up, like, getting a – a guy who's not going to play, like a Jack Tuttle in the portal, and I'm not saying you're going to get Jack Tuttle, but someone like him who's Zach had Allen, some spot start. Zach, yeah, thing, Zach they Allen, did, like, what they did. was he a quarterback for, like, 30 seconds, then he was the holder all year? Yeah. But we need somebody like that who's who's played a lot of football and is just here to kind of, like, maybe learn from Shiano as a coach to continue his career as a GA or a coach eventually. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to – we're in a bad position – because of how we've recruited the quarterback position over the last few years, where we don't have any backups at this point. And it's we could... insane. So, um, and this is mean, a, a hole they dug for themselves, honestly. This. Uh, it's tough. I'm looking now like a potential like coaches, like even like, I like Joe Daly's out, I still as one of my top options, but he's an NFL guy. He's not gonna bring quarterback with him. Um, yeah. You could always do it. I'm not even gonna, I don't want to speculate this at all, but McNulty's under fire up at Boston College, and I, I just don't want to see the pro style again, plus he, the way he got, yeah. like, canned in the first place. He's and, not coming uh, back. Yeah, I know. I don't think so, but it'd be funny. And that, that would – why? like, we mentioned the, the lack of RPOs. It looked like a pro style offense. It's miserable. That doesn't work yep. unless you're Bama or, like, well, I don't even know who it works with any other than Bama. Like, 
Everyone well, runs a uses spread. it anymore. Even yeah, yeah. even Bama uses spread. Like it's if just... you look at if you look at what like Nick Saban, he's constantly evolving with his approach, mm-hmm. with the rule changes, with what he's been beaten by, because he's a defensive minded head coach, so he knows what works against defense and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. And I think you saw him fundamentally change his approach to playing offense the first time that Clemson beat them in the, in the national championship, seeing what that offense was under Deshaun Watson. Oh, yeah. He's like, okay, this is what I need to do now. And that's what he did. He stopped recruiting like the the A.J. McCarron types, and he went more towards like the Bryce Young types, um, the two Tagovailoa types, the guys who yeah, can actually move true. the pocket, who have some mobility to them. Um, but, yeah. I just don't know where you go because, like, it, most likely, and this is just me speculating a little bit, I have a feeling that they're going to go with a lower-level guy and bring him up, sort of like what uh, – not what Harrisoniak was, but like um, I guess more of like a, a Heatherman type hire, but he'd be a coordinator because like you're, we're we're speculating the Villanova guy, the Fordham head coach, but is there are quarterback commits even good enough to like play at this level? Probably not, if I had to guess. So you'd have to go around the region and try to find someone, and that that's where I think a kid like Tyler Douglas. I'm not saying he's the next Kenny Pickett because he plays at Kenny Pickett's high school. He's a Temple commit. He plays at Ocean Township. He's, he's pretty good. Like. Now, mind you, it depends on what kind of offense they want to run and all that, too. But it's it's an option, and, it, and I think he'd flip in a heartbeat and stay, and stay home. And you don't want to see another uh, another Ocean Township kid go somewhere else and thrive. Yeah, that, that would not be a good look for, for the, the football program. Because, um, I mean, at the end of the day, like, I'm sure the Ocean Township high school coach, whoever that is, mm-hmm. would give an honest assessment. Like, this guy's better than – if he says, like, he's better than Pickett – Kind of hard to believe that, but yeah, true. Um, but yeah, we'll they see. need a quarterback. They need a quarterback bad. I don't know what you do, but we, there's only so much you can speculate on right now. For sure, and we will get deep into the the Michigan preview later this week um, on its own podcast. But uh, Rutgers now sitting at four and four with its remaining four games being home game versus Michigan, which is Saturday night at seven thirty. Uh, we play on the road. at Reeling Michigan State, they might not have half their roster. They would that Penn State at home, then Maryland on the road. So the Michigan State game I got today won't be uh, announced game time until I think Saturday. Okay. Um, they won't be prime time though, so it will be either twelve or three thirty, whatever that time slot is, or okay. hopefully not two thirty again because that was bizarre. Yeah, I think they're trying to still pick out what uh, penitentiary the game's going to be held at, since half their team will be in jail by that hey, point. Hey. But. Some uh, some scummy scummy stuff there. Yeah, and what else would you expect out of Mel Tucker, who's probably He's, the most classless head coach in? in did you Power see him Five. swing? Did yeah, him swing, not, swing at the fan. Like Jesus, dude, what are you doing? He's a, like? he's, he's a total maniac, and yeah. it's it's amazing how <laughs> how much money he was able to siphon out of just hitting a home run with uh, Kenny Walker. Um, yeah. That's that's all it was. <laughs> yeah, nothing else. It's wild. Like without Kenneth Walker last year, how many games do you think they went? Eight. Yeah, probably like seven, yeah. seven, eight. Yeah. Like he single-handedly beat Michigan in that, that really yeah. ugly rainy he's, game. And then you see him now; he's still killing it in the league. And it's like, geez, you got lucky as hell with that guy. I know. But anyway, what else? We got? All right. So we've, we've talked a lot about football. Uh, let's move on to basketball. They Ooh, had their. Yeah, the good stuff. Uh, they had their, their scrimmage yesterday. Uh, the, sorry, it's an, an exhibition game to, to benefit uh, Spinal Cord Research and Eric Weiran's foundation. Um, the game itself, uh, Rutgers won 78 to 65. Uh, some really interesting. Um, it's really interesting to see the new players on the team, from Cam Spencer to the freshman in uh, the, the new number zero on the team, Derek Simpson, Antonio Chole and Antonio Wolfolk, and that's kind of probably what I imagine uh, most people want to hear about. So what did you see from the new guys that was promising or concerning? Uh, we'll start well, with Cam Spencer. Okay, uh, Spencer, um, up and down. Uh, he, he was a big hustle guy, which we've seen in practice a couple times. Yep. You guys finally got to see it, um, I guess, live or on BTN Plus or whatever the stream was. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a big-time hustle guy. Uh, he, he did some nice things. He drove to the rim, cut pretty well. Uh, he's a, he's a pretty good rebounder for his uh for his height too as well and then his position because it's not a spot where you're going to get many rebounds but uh no he, he I didn't think he played bad I think he was a little nervous at first um and that's that's just part of uh 
getting the nerves out. Like it is the rack. It's the first time playing there. It's a little, little nerve wracking. They have been practicing there here and on and off. So it's not like it's anything new to him, but I, I think he'll, he'll fit in just fine. He, I don't think he hit a three if I'm looking correctly. Yeah. He didn't hit a three after, uh, anything, but, uh, he, he'll, he'll be, he'll be perfectly fine. I still think he's going to average around like double digit points. Um, now who, who else is after that? Derek Simpson, I guess we could go with. Um, he phenomenal. The kid, the kid's good. The kid's just really good. He looked, I know Fairfield's not the best competition in the world, but, but they are pretty good for their conference. And it is Jay Young coach team, which is basically the Pikeville coach team. So a lot of defense, a lot of emphasis on that, but, uh, he, he looked really good. Um, I know he was, if you were to tell me as somebody who had never watched Rutgers play, that one of these guys who played 20 plus minutes is a true freshman. It would not, my guess would not have been Derek Simpson. He looks so comfortable out there yeah. on, offensively and defensively. He's got this fire that we haven't probably seen since uh, uh, Jacob Young on the team. Every mm -hmm. time there was a timeout after a big play, he was pumping his chest, getting the crowd involved in it, staring down the opposing bench. Like, this is a guy <laughs> Rutgers fans are going to fucking love. Yeah, he, he's got that little bit of swagger to him. That, like, yep. like you said, Jacob Young had that as well. Um, and he's super athletic. Um, yes. Now he's got to work on his defense a little bit. Like, I'm, I'm gonna nitpick a little bit with that aspect, but his offense is there. Um, he's he's probably the biggest high flyer on the team. I mean, I, you can count Cliff obviously because Cliff gets up higher than anyone. But yeah. But but Simpson Simpson's right there. Like he he's crazy athletic. He's not afraid of contact, which I love. Uh, could it get him in trouble and? on uh, the offensive end sometimes, maybe a little bit, but he's a freshman. He's going to have some mistakes here and there, but he, he basically showed you everything that Pike's been hyping him up about it since he signed last year. So that, that was just a, uh, that was just a really good showing from him. And I, th I think you're going to see more of that this season. And I, I crazy to say, he might be your sixth man. I mean, if we're basing anything off of the minute, this distribution we saw yesterday, mm -hmm. he is, and obviously Caleb didn't play. So he's got to be yeah. in the top seven, but at the, at worst, He's the last man in the seven man rotation based on minutes that were played yesterday. Yeah, uh, let's, first let's start off the to, bench. Yeah. Let's 100%. move on to uh, the two remaining freshmen who didn't see nearly as many minutes as Derek Simpson. But uh, let's start with Antonio Wolfolk, who was the backup five in this one. Um, he actually played a little four, too. I saw him on the court with, I don't know how long the exact time frame was, but he was on the court with Cliff for like a minute or two. Um, I thought that was interesting. But he is going to be the dominant backup five, I believe. Um, you can kind of mix and match him with Reber. They bring two different skill sets to the game. Wolfolk, uh, mind you, he was he was a football player at this time last year. He wasn't even thinking about hoops, and he uh, he's got the body, he's got the athleticism. He's he's, he's pretty uh, little, little built. Like he's got some size to him. I want to say he's every bit of like six nine, six ten. Like he, he is a big boy. He can uh, he can hold his own down low. He can do anything really super offensively. Um, he's got great footwork. Uh, you didn't you see much of it this game, but he does have really good vision for out of the post as well. Uh, yeah. I don't want to, I hate comparing him to like big name, like superstars, but like the best passing, like big man I know is probably Al Horford. It, there's like glimpses of that. You can kind of start to see like he, he is a really good player. And I think another like really good find by Pike. And at the end of the day, people are like, this class sucks. They got Simpson, a three star, no one offered the uh, Bullfolk, a football player. Yeah. Joel, where the hell he come from? Like, Michael knows what he's doing. Just trust the man. Yeah. It, it is interesting when you see him offer, like, you know, the number 47 ranked player in the country, and then the same day he offers a guy who has, you know, two Iona. offers from the, the – yeah, from Iona and St. Peter's, and people are like, why are we offering this kid when we're going after the other? It's, it's because Pike obviously sees something. Mm -hmm. He's looking for traits. He's looking for coachability. He's looking for fits in his in his program because ultimately he's going to be able to develop these guys better than most coaches because he's he's not looking for the one and done type dudes like even when we got Cliff who was the top fifty guy he was coming in as a developmental player like he was he sh yeah. he showed elite athletic athleticism in high school but he was far from a finished product like he was oh, more of a defender yeah. he had no offensive game coming into Rutgers. And no, he's developed him into a really, really potent offensive player. And we'll get to that in a bit. But let's finish mm -hmm. with um, we saw it of Antonio Chole. He only played a few minutes. So maybe I, this isn't a fair uh, yeah, this is a, this is a tough one. Yeah. I think he uh, – it says listed two minutes. I don't think he got, like, a full 60 seconds on the court, um, <laughs> if I'm being honest. So, I mean, it's hard to, like, say anything about him. But I've seen him in practice a couple times. He does look really good. He looks like a player. Um, I don't know. I actually thought uh, he'd actually out – 
out of uh, outplay uh, Wolf Folk at this point because I thought they'd kind of split the minutes a little bit and re play more backup five. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it, it, it was interesting to see him only get two minutes. And again, if you look at the numbers, it, it basically screams what Pike's been kind of doing the past couple of years. It's kind of like a seven, eight man rotation. I don't think he's going to go much deeper than that. Out of conference play, yeah, whatever. Like you're you're playing some like. I hate to say it's the schedule still like a little weak out of conference. So you're going to play a bunch of nobody. So they might go like 10 deep, 11 deep, maybe even 12 deep at some times. But for the big games, the majority, like the games that like matter a little more, uh, it's going to be like a seven, eight man rotation. And that's kind of what you're starting to see already. And are you saw in game one, I guess. Yeah. And something you mentioned with uh, Cam Spencer that he didn't hit a three pointer, even though he's known for his, you know, long range uh, prowess. But, you know, who did hit a three pointer? Big Cliff. Oh, which yes. We've yeah. been hearing about all off season is how he's extending such a his sh- range. It was, Ugh. I mean, it was a little awkward looking. Um, his yeah. race is obviously not the fastest, That's but slow. it was a clean look. It was a clean look, and he knocked it down. And, and honestly, mm. just the threat of having a guy who can shoot, even if it's like 28%, like you have to guard him. You can't give him a wide open look. And Cliff had a few really nice, he had that, I think he had the first basket of the game, Mm -hmm. like right around the top of the key, he hit a knockdown shot. He had that turnaround bank shot from right around the same place in the second half. Like he really has done so much work into expanding his offensive game since he started mm. at Rutgers last year. You remember how many shots he missed around the beginning, <laughs> around the rim at the beginning of the season? So and bad. by the end we... of the year, he was just like like money every time he got within six mm-hmm. feet of the rim. Yeah. I see that kind of how Cliff's expanded his game this offseason. Like, he's become a formidable mid-range shooter with the possibility to expand his range even further. I think we, we will see how that actually goes throughout the season. Yeah. Um, but I, I thought it was really promising what we saw at a Cliff's offensive game. Yeah, he, he's going to lead this team in scoring. I think that's without yeah. a doubt, without a, any question whatsoever, whether it be, like, getting foul going up or just his touch around the rim, like you mentioned. Um, and now he's expanding it. He's hitting jump shots. He's hitting three-pointers. Is it the greatest shot in the world, the prettiest shot in the world? No, but they got guys like Sean Marion who made the league, so I'm like, whatever. Yep. <laughs> um, a little dig there at Sean Marion. Yeah, geez. Uh, but, no, yeah, yeah quite, quite, quite strange out here. Him, uh, Joe Kim Noah, like those shots were both, yeah. like, they're ugly, but they work, so who cares? But uh, yeah, he's going to expand his game. I know a lot of people were worried that he was going to expand it a little too much and get a little too comfortable out there, but he, he seems to be the same old Cliff. He's still going to dominate the paint. Is he going to lead the country in dunks again? Maybe. Close. I don't think he'll probably do that because I think he'll expand it a little more, but I do think he'll still have quite a bit of dunks. You'll still see the the tip off that leads to the alley-oop to him because for some reason teams still don't want to cover that. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, he'll he'll probably lead this team in scoring, and I think you, in order to win games, you're gonna have to get him like 17, 17 plus a game at least. Yeah, yeah, and if you, if you listen to the the Pike press conference after the game, they were obviously like effusive in the praise of the foundation, all the work they're doing. Yeah. But he, what the one thing he also mentioned is that they didn't really show much of what they're actually going to do in the season. They kept it pretty vanilla. So I'm interested to see what that means moving forward in terms of how they're going to change the offense because they did so much iso ball the last couple years with Gio and Ron. I'd love to see like a, a well-established like driving kick game between like Paul and Derek Simpson and, and guy like Cam Spencer, because mm-hmm. that's how you get him those, those clean looks is you suck in defenders to defend around the rim. And then you have a wide open corner three from Cam Spencer. Um, so I, I think it'll be yeah. interesting to see how the offense changes from what we saw in the exhibition to what we see moving forward. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Like you said, just put, honestly, spot up Cam, Cam Spencer at the wing or the corner. Let Paul go nuts with Derek up top, and then just put Quiff in, like, the, the mid-type block area, and then just let him let him go to work. Uh, this offense has, has has a lot of potential. There's a lot of a lot of young guys. They're, they finally have a good shooter. Paul Paul's a great uh, ball handler. He's, he had double-digit assist again. I mean, this this offense has a lot of potential, and you, you saw glimpses of it. Uh, on Sunday, jeez. Yeah. Um, so we've covered a lot in this pod. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to hit on before we sign off today? Um, let me think. No, not not really. I know. Uh, obviously, we didn't talk about Moat Mag, and I, I kind of want to mention him. I, I've been very hyped about. I've been hyping him up <laughs> every single practice I've seen so far. Uh, he he looked just every bit of uh, what I've seen, what I've said on the boards, what I've said in the uh, articles. 
Uh, he's he's quick. He's fast. He's twitchy. He's he's slowing down a little bit in terms of uh, the play style and the game starting to catch up with him. So now he's trying to figure it out. But I mean, maybe don't take 15 shots. But that's don't do that. But uh, yep. 15 points, eight rebounds. I mean, he had a really good game. He didn't hit any threes either. The team in general didn't hit many threes, and they still managed to put up 78. Imagine what happens when they start hitting threes. Went four, yeah. 13 for yep. three. Like then it's like, oh shit! Like this team putting up 80. 80 points. Now, I might be hyping it up because, again, it's Fairfield. Fairfield didn't score over the past, like, last two minutes of the game. Yep. But uh, I think the defense is there. A little concerned with Caleb not being there, but getting him back, he'll slide right in the role where Hyatt's at, in my opinion, and Mag probably goes up to the floor, and you get, you got a great you got a great lineup, a uh, couple of nice pieces off the bench, and this this team's going to be going to be good. I think this is uh this is the year three in a row. I think they're going to finally do it. I, I think they make the tournament as well. I think this is a much more balanced team than we've seen in years past for Pike. Um, the contributions I think will be a little more evenly spread out outside of Cliff. Mm-hmm. I think Cliff is clearly going to be the focal point of the team on both offense and defense. Um, but the, the the peripheral scorers will be pretty even depending on how defenses play us. And I think we kind of have more matchup base options that we can attack as well with a guy like Derek Simpson. If we need, you know, if a team's playing us soft in the middle, you could slash and score a lot of points that way. If teams are playing us in, we have a sharpshooter now in Cam Spencer who can knock down shots. And then the big question is how much did uh, Caleb's offensive game uh, improve over the past year? Like if he's even like 80% of the offensive player he was in Dayton, you know, he's a really well-rounded guy, but we need to kind of just see if that's the way they plan to use him or if he's still going to just be like a guy that is very sparingly used on the offensive end. Yeah, no, it's it's going to be a good year. Um, but guys, really appreciate you tuning in once again. Uh, for me and Richie, this has been another edition of the Night Report podcast. Signing off.